Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to just, Mark, if you're out there, I'm going to start over because my mic was not turned on. Sorry about that, everybody. My mic wasn't turned on. So let's start over, shall we? Hello there, members of the EDAP 688 class. We are going to go over what the class structure is tonight, uh, especially how we're going to do the assignments and especially how we're going to do the final. I will then dive into module one. It's a pretty straightforward module, it won't take me long. But I want you to see how much stuff is packed in here that I'm going to have to ask you to carry the load on reading and thinking. As you can see here in the start uh, part of the uh, course, it says taking an online class is different than taking a face-to-face -face class. So you're going to be responsible for reading just about everything I put out here. Now, the other day I had somebody email me or text me, I forget which now, about the book that they see in here, the Understanding by Design book. And they were asking, there's only just certain chapters of it in the, um, in the module. And I wrote back and said, that's because that book, if we went out and bought it, which we used to buy when I first started teaching this class, was $95. I mean, it was like, what? So I just basically have said, I'm not going to put that on to any student. And I just went into the Google books and found the appropriate chapters we needed. And ta-da, there it is. If you find it hard to read through the Blackboard, and you know, since I'm the guy who's legally blind, that whenever I look at something, that's part of what I look at is how hard it is to read, can go to Google Books and put in Understanding by Design, and you can find it for yourself. You can also pull down that onto a Kindle if, if you have that. So it, it is probably the biggest part of the reading that we'll have to do, but... Um, next week when we start doing TPAC and Tim, you've had a little bit of TPAC from me in the past, but now we're going to take a deep dive into TPAC and a deep dive into Tim so that you can see what we're talking about tonight and how it then relates to those two entities. Uh, the other thing, of course, that I always do is I freely give you my text number at 502-457-2937. All of you know that number, hopefully, um, and you know that you can just text me when you have a question, uh, whether it be something procedural about the class, whether it's something stupid I said in class, uh, or whether you're just stuck on an idea. And you know that I will get back with you, if not immediately, pretty darn quick. Um, I, I take great pride in the fact that I try to keep my students in the loops. In fact, one of you was good enough to point out to me that when I copied this class over from Blackboard, it pulled over um, older copies of the course and I went through and cleaned all that up. We'll look at all that tonight. Um, but the other thing too is I want you to feel free to take your time. In other words, just because we're going to cover the, the bulk of this class, within a fairly short period of time doesn't mean you have to turn right around and turn in your final. You have until the stated end of the class to have your final turned in. I hope that alleviates any stress or, and some of you are the kind of folks who want to rush right through and get it all done and turn it in right away. And that's fine too. I have a problem with that. I will record just like I'm doing now and I will post that recording in two different places. I will put them in the announcement section of our class right there. I will also actually put them into each one of the modules. Just like I did, here's the welcome video I sent you last Friday. So down here for our first module tonight, the Conceptual Theoretical Framework Standards and Curriculum, I will put the video that I create tonight right here. So if you want to watch it at your own time, at your own pace, at your own place, that's the whole point of having it in online. 
But as you're watching it, if I say something you're not clear on, if I don't make it clear the assignment, do not hesitate to jump in and send me that text. Okay? So let's look at structure real fast because you know the structure. So here's where the syllabus is. Uh, the syllabus is clean except for there is a mistake. And it is on page 8, I believe. 11. Yeah, I got it down to 12 pages. I, I think that's pretty good. Uh, on page 11, where it says criteria for determination of grade, uh, it has two uh, modules that have been sort of lumped together, and they should be split. In other words, module one is 10 points, module two is 10 points, module three is 10 points, module four is 10 points, and then the hallmark is 60 points for a total of, of 100. Straightforward. But realize that these two things that we're doing um, represent different point values. Other than that, I can't really find anything. I've gone through and, and looked it over a couple of times. If you do find something that is gl a glaring discrepancy, remember the blackboard is the point of primary source. So whatever is in the blackboard is what counts. But if you do find something that's a glaring discrepancy between the blackboard and what's in the syllabus, let me know. I mean, you know, I, I do take my time. I do do my due diligence. Uh, and try to make sure everything is synced up and everything looks good. And I don't mind being told when I make a mistake. Don't mind that at all. Let's do, do a quick run through of the modules and then we'll come back and look at assignments and then we'll look at the hat. So we only have a very few modules. Um, in the old days, this class, when I say old days, 11 years ago, when I first started teaching this class, I was a, an instructional design uh, curriculum person for Jefferson County Public Schools, as a lot of you know. Uh, the stuff that people did in their classrooms came out of my shop that I had with about mm, 12 people that worked together out at uh, Computer Ed at Jaeger. Um, and of course, Back then, there was the beginnings of the rumbling of what is now called the curriculum maps. So the problem with curriculum and, and is that it has become, at least in our school district, and in a lot of school districts, it has become sort of, this is what you do. And, you know, my joke is it's Tuesday, so therefore we're teaching this. So curriculum design by individual teachers has kind of gone away, which is a shame. It always should have been curriculum, that map should have been suggestions, but people should have been left alone to flesh it out. But what I want to do with module number one is I just want to go back and let's define some things so that you have... Um, language that you can hang what we're going to be working with that you can hang it on. Um, and am I doing this because it has practical applications to what you do every day? Yes and no. If you're going on to do a higher degree, a PhD or a DED, then this is something that you're going to run smack up against. You're going to be talking about conceptual frameworks and theoretical frameworks all the time. Um, if you're going to become a curriculum designer, uh, that's another class, frankly. They, you know, if they'll ever let me go back and teach that again, I'll let you know. Because that, that is one of my strengths, is curriculum design. So we're going to look at that tonight. Uh, this will not be a very heavy lift because there it is, <laughs> right there in front of you. Uh, this is the whole idea. And in fact, the assignment for this is basically for you to create a, a infographic uh, looking at a comparison of these two ideas. We're just going to basically wave, do a wave at this one, the curriculum design. I'm, I've got a good video in here. I encourage you to watch it because I think he does a really nice job. Now, he's a 
he's a medical guy. He teaches at a medical college, but it's one of the best ex explanations of curriculum design that I've ever seen. Not that you're going to have to do it. Then over here is ISTE standards. Now we have to understand ISTE standards because right now I'm sitting on a sitting with a group of people representing the Commonwealth of Kentucky at all kinds of levels, from everything from classroom teachers to district level people to KDE people to university people. And we are at this time writing the standards for technology use in the state of Kentucky. Now, one of the smart things, and I give Marty Parks, who, it, Dr. Marty Parks, I've known Marty forever. That's why I can call him Marty. Um, Marty did a brilliant idea when he basically said, this thing we've called uh, the Kentucky Curriculum for Instructional Technology, actually it just says technology, tries to do everything. And we shouldn't try to do everything because there's too many moving parts in here. So they met and they came up with the, the computer science standards. And you go back and look at those. They're for grades K through 12. Um, and it's really, really well done. I kind of I circled in on that. At one time, they asked me to come in and work with a group on a certain part of it. And, and enjoyed it very much. Now, the, the, what I'm working with now, though, would be the very much the implementation of ISTE. See, that's how I got back to it. The implementation of ISTE into the state standards for technology use in the classroom. And because of that, then, that leads us to this which is module number two, which is understanding TPAC and TIM. TPAC and TIM represent the yin and yang of that. And I'll let you figure out which one is which. I'll tell you next week, but you know. The whole point of the reason why I use TPAC and TIM is very straightforward. One's theoretical, one's conceptual frameworks. Although, as you'll learn from if you take any higher ed classes about research, the two kind of slide back and forth. Although I think there's some, there's some definite lines that can be drawn between the two that uh, define them. Um, TPAC is sort of the solid. It is the one that's been around the longest. Um, we'll go into a deep dive on TPAC. Right now, the original owners of TPAC, the two guys that thunk it up, uh, have kind of not walked away from it, but they've kind of pulled back from it. Uh, and a, a lady by the name of Judy Harris, who is probably the queen of instructional technology, I hope you don't mind if I use that term, she is the emperor. How about that? She is the know-all and be-all of instructional technology. Uh, Judy was located down at um, Texas Tech. She's now, I think, over at Virginia Tech. She has taken over the TPAC wiki. Um, and the TPAC blog. Um, I, don't even, I don't even know if, if uh, Punya and Kohler are even together up at Michigan State anymore. I'll, I'll look that up for next week. You know, there's so many underlying stories behind <laughs> technology well, and anything, any kind of research stuff. There's always an underlying story. There's always a um, almost soap opera-ish bent to when you get into research. It's, that's, that's the part of it that fascinates me. And I actually was a part of a team here uh, that was researching TPAC in terms of its evolution and how far back we could go looking for echoes of TPAC. Now, as you'll see when we get into it, it actually has a starting point. There's a definite point where the term was created, it was presented, so on. But what we were trying to do is go back and look at all the various studies. That's how we determined it, were studies. And then we further narrowed that down to studies that represented dissertations. In other words, who had done a dissertation about the use of technology in education. And we went back. When I say we, uh, my good friend, Dr. Bob Rono, who um, has left this university, uh, Bob's up at University of Cincinnati. We were we were curious about 
when you went back and looked at the early, early, early inklings of technology use in education, what did it look like? Did it have a framework? Did it have any way of looking at it that made sense? And folks, when I say early, um, you know, I've been around long enough that I sat at a teletype machine over in the life sciences building here um, at the University of Louisville and would pull in the information um, that various professors that were researching stuff that the guy I worked for, a guy by the name of Ron Atlas, it may be a name you know, uh, here at the University of Louisville. Dr. Atlas is famous for his research on um, biodegradable um, bugs, excuse me, bugs that could biodegrade oil. That's his claim to fame. Uh, very, um, very famous for that, as a matter of fact, once you get outside of Louisville. And he was also the uh, graduate school uh, chair, I think, for a very long time. Great guy. But anyway, I, I worked for him as a, as a GA, as, as a slave back in the day. And one of my jobs was I sat on a teletype machine. Now, if you've ever heard of a teletype machine, you are shaking your head right now going, how in the world could you get research out of that? Well, what teletype machines were, were basically a typewriter. I mean, it was a typewriter that was connected to a network. And so when information was sent back and forth, there would be this bell that would go ding, 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 that told you that something was coming in, and then the machine would just start typing. And then it would go ding, ding, ding to indicate that it was finished with whatever it was sending you, and you tore it off. Uh, same thing. I could sit there and, and type in a very long script that basically said, I am sending this out to, you know, Stanford University or College of whatever, whatever. And then I would start typing it in. Now, those of you who know me are laughing your heads off right now because you're going, the man can't type. Well, actually, I can type, but it's just with two fingers. I cannot touch type. Um, and it has to do with the fact that when I had taken typing back in high school, when all there were were typewriters, um, I couldn't see well enough to, to do the keyboard. Now, I'm not saying that to you looking for any kind of pity or anything. I'm just saying... So what I had to do was I had to, and when we get to UDL, we'll talk about this, I had to do a flex. I had to do a, well, let's do it a different way. And so I've learned to type with two fingers. And I can type with two fingers just about as fast as anybody who holds down a job typing. I am no way as good as a touch typist. My son is a touch typist, and he can do about 100 words a minute. Um, no, I, I can't do that. But also the other thing about using a teletype machine was you had to kind of hit the keys hard. So it wasn't a nice soft touch like you do with computers now or you do, did with electric typewriters. So TPAC, we were looking at TPAC and then kind of looking back in time at where <laughs> education and technology first started being talked about, written about, and so on. And it goes all the way back to those very early days. Fascinating stuff. We'll get into it. Tim is a technology integration matrix. Um, and Tim and SAMR, substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition, have been sort of competing tools. I've dropped SAMR. And the reason why I dropped SAMR is because SAMR does not have, SAMR has examples, but it doesn't have an instrument. And we'll go over what that means. It doesn't have an instrument. So that as I, as a researcher, if I walk into a, a classroom and I want to sit down and I want to start looking at what's going on in the classroom, I need something, some kind of guide, some kind of instrument. And SAMR just doesn't have it. Tim, Tim does. And you'll be doing it. <coughs> so that's why I've gone with Tim instead of SAMR. And the other reason why I'm going with Tim, uh, and that came up this summer when we were working on the uh, Kentucky Standards for Technology, was that um, most of the folks in the room were very much aware of Tim, and most of the folks in the room were sort of, sort of aware of SAMR, and it wasn't really all that used. Here's the meat. Here's the lift. Here's where we'll sit for a while. This is understanding, understanding by design. 
Understanding by design is a curriculum structure created by two gentlemen by the name of Grant Wiggins and Jay McTeague. As I said, I had the great honor of sitting in on the professional development training being done by uh, Grant, by Dr. Wiggins. And um, so when you see these videos that are in here of him talking, I'm not, that's not when he, I was there, but it's, it's as close as, <laughs> it, it just brings back lots of fond memories. That's the first place I ever heard of Think, Pair, Share, you know, language that I use every day or every time I teach, you know, I picked up from um, Grant. He was a good man. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, which I think is a true loss. Um, Jay McTeague, who was his partner, um, is still around, and he still carries the torch. Now, let me help you understand. Understanding by design is ASCD certified. In other words, it is a big deal. Understanding by design is behind how curriculum is looked at in Odom County Public Schools. Understanding by design was one of the pieces that Charlotte Danielson looked at when she did that whole PGS fiasco, excuse me, that whole PGS curriculum framework thing that she came up with. All you have to do is scratch it a little bit and you'll, you'll find the understanding by design stuff that's in there. Understanding by design has been around for a very, not a very long time, but it's been around long enough that when you use the term UD, UBD in a group of curricular writers, they all nod very sagely and go, yep, yep, understand, understand. It has some very straightforward and I think some very meaningful uh, ideas that can be very succinctly stated. One of those is you can't start a journey until you know the destination. Excuse me, that's my phone telling me that there's a severe thunderstorm cranking up outside. <clears throat> I hope you're safe. So you can't start a journey until you know your destination. Now, yeah, <laughs> you know, those of us who like just go wander kind of chafe at that, but, but you get the idea. You need to know where you're going before you start. And then the other thing is that I really, really believe in Grant's definition of what teaching and education should be about. We are coaches of understanding. We are not purveyors. We are not shills of curriculums that somebody has come up with. That's a direct dig at the various packages that have appeared over the years. The latest one was, I think, at Bellarmine, where there was a guy that came in from um, Texas, uh, Dallas, if I'm not mistaken, or Houston, who basically walked in and said, I've got the solution for how we should teach reading. It'll improve everybody's scores. Teachers are not that, okay? Teaching cannot be packaged like that. If it was, well, <laughs> they wouldn't need us anymore, folks. They could just put kids in front of these machines and say, well, just start there and then work your way through it and, you know, you'll be it. It's, it's the thing that Google does with the Google Classroom where it says, become a Google Classroom teacher, be certified. And you sit there and you go, no, no. <laughs> You're shilling a product here. You, you want these, these folks to understand your Google Classroom online curriculum, or online structure, along with the G Suite, along with sites, and you know, on and on. Teachers are coaches of understanding. And the, the way then that kids demonstrate that is through meaning making. Oh, so you just taught me this. This is how I understand it to be. And transfer. 
So when I do a demonstration, you hear me, say, how many times have you heard me say that? Kids should be doing demonstrations of understandings. And that's not a test. It can be, but it's not just a test. One of the things that sent me over the moon this last year was I got invited to sit in on the digital backpack thing. <laughs> there, I cleaned it up. I got to sit in on the digital backpack thing. And, you know, people were saying all these kinds of things that I just said to you about teachers being coaches, understanding, kids doing meaning making, transfer, you know, and I'm just smiling and going, huh, how very UBD of you. And then I saw the first presentation. And the kid gets up and then somebody is running the computer. That set my alarm bells ringing right there. When's the last time you did a demonstration or you did a presentation where somebody ran the computer for you? Uh, and then they're sitting back there and the kid is going, this is, these are my scores for my MPAs and my PAs. And then somebody back there is hitting a, a, a slide, you know. First of all, I'm sitting up there going, is that a FERPA violation? Okay. And then the second thing I'm looking at is the deadness of the whole thing. The kid is just standing there and basically... And then after the third presentation, I realized what I was looking at was a canned presentation. In other words, the kids really didn't do anything. They were told, what do you want to put in this slide? Okay. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the slides were pictures of things. And I don't mean like pictures of a model that represented the planetary structure for the solar system or a model that represented size comparisons, anything like that, which would have been cool. Heck, I would have gotten excited for a model of a volcano, right? No, these are just literally pictures of where kids had written things on a worksheet. Sorry, I banged the table. That is not meaning making and transfer. UBD does explain all of that through their facets of understanding. And that's where, after I crank all this into your heads, we will land on facets of understanding and really sit there. Because, and this is, you gotta realize, this was how many years ago? God, how many years ago did I sit in that PD with Grant? 20? So 20 years ago, no, yeah, 20 years ago, we were just starting to talk about some of the stuff that we just take for granted now. You know, one-to-one, -one, we were getting all jazzed about one-to-one -one back then. But that was with laptops. Now, okay, understanding, understanding by design. That'll be the lift. Uh, I've, here's a marvelous uh, PDF, which we'll revisit, that basically gives you UBD in a nutshell. Great PDF. This one, if, if we have to have one that is coming from the head, the brain, it's that one right there. Although there's a lot of heart in that too, as you just heard. But here's where my heart really does live. Universal Design for Learning. Why UDL? UDL is a curriculum framework. Um... But more importantly, it is a philosophical way of looking at the world that I think makes a heck of a lot more sense than Tomlinson's differentiation. I have never understood that. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's just make work. It's busy work. This UDL makes sense. And as I said, it makes sense to my brain and it makes sense to my heart. Um, and, and that's part of the problem with UDL is that it doesn't have, it doesn't have that hard, let's go in and watch a class like Tim does. And for that matter, like TPAC does, it doesn't have that, but what it has is a real deep belief structure in what it's going to, what I'm going to preach at you about. And yes, 
I deliberately use that word preach, folks, because I'm proselytizing on this one. I have been a UDL, gosh, all the way back to my years of being in a classroom. I have been using UDL as a foundation to the way that I would teach. Uh, and especially when my kids would be mainstreamed into quote unquote regular classrooms. But even more importantly, UDL um, is now everywhere. And uh, the best example that I always give, and people get tired of hearing it, but it's still the best example because when I go into when I go into places, I still look around, and the first thing I'm looking for is the aisle signs. And how much bigger aisle signs have become than they were just 10 years ago. And I told you the story about being in Kroger, asking a guy who was walking around who was obviously from Kroger home office, asking about his uh, signs and said, Is, am I crazy or do you people really put up bigger signs now? He said, oh, absolutely. We put up bigger signs because people are getting older and they need to be able to see them. Home Depot and Lowe's, same story. Yeah. So UDL is all around us. Um, it is part and parcel of who we are. And in fact, I tell you what, I tell you what, they have just redone the street over in front of the Houchins buildings here on campus. Um, Mark and Bree, I know you all are down here. Go over there and look at that building. Now, what's Houchins? Houchins is where the births are, the registrars, where you go get your ID made. There's a bunch of stuff in there. I, I think um, I think the uh, the newspaper for the university is there. But they rebuilt that whole street over the summer. It's no longer a street. It's now like a walkway. So that when you go down, you know, you've got the the um, the Bingham Academic Building, the BAB. And then Houchins across the, the, the street, which is now this sort of walkway. And what's interesting is the walkway is straight. And then they have this sort of winding brick path. I don't know what that's supposed to represent. But here's where I'm going with this, kids. Look at how you get into the building, how you get into Houchins. I'll film it. Uh, it would be a great place to go and demonstrate acceleration with kids. If you want to have a place to look at that rise over run and all that. Um, but it's also an excellent place to look at something to do with UDL. And as I said, I'll go film it and bring it back to you. Module five, you're not doing anything with this. This was just something that we created over the years. People would say to me, this is really great stuff. We need to put it in here. So that when you get to your final, you have some resources to look at. Now, over the years, I have found that most teachers have gotten into their own resources, and that is wonderful. Uh, you are not being told that you have to use one of these. And in fact, what I would like you to do as a part of this Module 5 is just, if you've got something that's good and you want to share it, let me know, and then we'll put it in here. Um, in fact, I, I was just looking at this yesterday and I don't have FET in here and you better believe I will get FET. Maybe it's buried down in here somewhere. Um, those of you who are science and math teachers, uh, at secondary level, although FET goes all the way down the elementary are all now nodding sagely at me and going, you idiot, why don't you have FET in there? So I'll make sure that it gets put, I'll put it in, but that this is just a resource. Okay. And then here's your hat. It says you will develop a technology-rich curriculum, mini, mini unit consisting of unit outline in five lessons using the understanding by design templates. These may be sequential and linear, or they may represent snapshots of different lessons which pulls together your teaching philosophy, technology integration skills, and curriculum development model. Please include one UDL example in your unit. Now, you know, when we do the UDL, I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, let me jump into assignments so you can see how this is all going to work. So when we go into assignments, 
um, like here's tonight's assignment that, um, do I have to have this done by next week, Steve? No. I just want you to see it. Um, when you're doing assignments in Blackboard, if you've never done one, basically what you do is you click on the link up there. Oh, look, it says it's worth 20 points. It's not. It's worth 10. I'll fix that. And then down here where it says write the submission, you're going to then basically put in the link that will take me to your infographic. That's it. Now, the rest of them are like that. Now, for the TPAC, let me show you TPAC. TPAC and Tim. What I did for TPAC, <laughs> what are these points doing so it's fouled up? Anyway, I'll fix it. Um, if you look here, you'll see that it tells you what to do, and then it gives you a document to use. And that document, basically, what it will do is it will let you create this. Okay? And so here it is, right here. Um, if you download this document and open it up in newer word but not word 365 365 won't do this you can put in a um, embedded code so that your chosen video will actually show up in here you don't have to you can just put the link in so in other words that way i know which video to go back and look at um, let's see i'm looking at yeah i'm looking at it on the you know the online one the word online and it doesn't have it should be right here it should allow me to put in link uh, from online stuff but it doesn't so if you're using the 365 version just put in the link that's all you got to do okay um the hat let me show you the hat I'm really sorry about these points here, folks. I don't know why that screwed up. I'll fix it. So here's the hat. So when you look at the hat, you have basically two templates that you'll be using. So here's the unit template. So this represents the little mini unit. And by the way, we will go over this. We'll actually do one together. So this is the unit template. And then the other template that's in here is your lesson plan template. And I want to tell you something. Oops, that's a unit one. I want to tell you something. You know, I've, I K-tipped, gosh, I have K-tipped since the beginning of K-tip. <laughs> okay. And one of the things I always found that was so stupid about K-tip, I love K-tip, by the way. I think it's, it's a shame it's gone. It's really going to come back to haunt us. But I think one of the things that I really disagreed with KTIP about was their lesson plan template. I thought it was worthless. I'm not worth. I thought it was too onerous, too much. This is the UBD one. Look at this, guys. It's simple. It's just as straightforward as it can be. There's, there's nothing hard here. Now, when we do this, we actually we'll do one of these together. When we do this, what I want you to realize is, and this is what you get from TPAC, right? Those of you who've had TPAC, what you get from TPAC is technology is not the beginning, unless you're teaching a technology class. In other words, if I'm teaching office, you know, in high school, yeah, it's the beginning. Otherwise, it is either the end piece, in other words, we use technology for kids to do demonstrations of understanding that shows making meaning and transfer, or it's a tool that helps kids find information, do things, etc. You don't have to have technology in every single one of these boxes because that would fly against everything I'm going to be teaching you. It fits somewhere. And your job is to figure out where. Now, I just realized that I've been opening things up inside of Collaborate. And if that's not showing up on the video, I apologize. Uh, but don't worry. You will, I will walk you through it. You won't have any trouble. All righty. Let me jump into, let's do module one. And again, 
Um, before I get going here, the assignments all have pretty straightforward except for the point values, which I'll fix tonight. Before you see this video, it'll be fixed. Um, those assignments do not have drop dead dates. But if you are the kind of person who needs to see if you're doing okay, you're going to let me know. And as soon as I hear from you, I will go in and grade it, and it'll show up in your grade center. You know where that is, right? Inside of um, right, my grades. It'll show up in your grade center. The two pages, those template pages that we were talking about, now you realize the second page, the one is the unit or the uh, lesson plan. You're going to have to do five of those, right? That represents the five little lessons that you put in. And so that's why I go with the idea it can be linear. So in other words, you're, do you have to come up with an essential question for each lesson? It's kind of stupid. That's what you do if you're doing snapshots. In other words, here's the essential question for this lesson that's all about this aspect. Here's the essential question for this different aspect, so on. If you're doing it where you're doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that stuff is all going to be the same, isn't it? What will change? What will change is the kids' demonstrations of understanding. Or it might be that it builds. In other words, here's what we did on Monday that builds in, that is then used for Tuesday, that's then used for Wednesday, and so on and so on. So you will have those five lesson plans. And if you want, you know, however you want to do that. In other words, if you want to copy that and go five, four copies down on the same long Word document, you go ahead. If you want to make five different lesson plan pages, files, you go ahead. But all of that, we're just going to copy over into the live text because they still are making me put hats in there. But you don't have to go into live text and do anything. We're just going to copy over what you create in the assignments here in our class. All righty. What is the conceptual theoretical framework? Well, pretty straightforward, actually, except it muddies the water a little bit. So a theoretical framework is looking at a much bigger question. So without giving too much away with TPAC, when we look at TPAC, which is a way of looking at technology instruction as a theoretical framework, it is because it encompasses a very large area. It can, though, be used to look at a very narrow area. In other words, I can use the TPAC framework, a theoretical framework, to look at what somebody is doing in their classroom teaching science using technology. Or I can look at a teacher teaching in their classroom using a smart board and then looking at the effectiveness, efficacy of that smart board use. Okay. When you look at a conceptual framework, it's usually made up of pieces from other things. You can have pieces from a theoretical framework. You can have pieces from other conceptual frameworks. But it is very much focused on what are we doing? What are we looking? And conceptual frameworks usually, usually have some kind of tool that generates information. Conceptual frameworks can be found both in qualitative and quantitative Theoretical is mainly in quantitative. You can kind of see that. 
you know, I, I think whoever got to the, the word theoretical first, you know, should get a prize because when they do that, it's like, Oh, you mean control groups and experimental groups and, you know, automatically your brain goes into that. Let me jump into the thing here. So here's a, a you know, nice down and dirty, um, if such a thing existed anymore, Cliff Notes version. Uh, maybe the Wikipedia version, I guess, is, although it's not. So you can see that a conceptual framework has very much a direction. It's somebody's idea of how the problem that we're looking at ought to be explored. But behind it, there is a theoretical framework, usually. Usually. And that theoretical framework is, of course, based upon a much broader general representation of the relationships that you're looking at. Now, let's bring, let's bring this home. Oh, there's some nice, um, you know, examples down here. Uh, this is very straightforward, and it's right here if you want to go all the way into it and look at it. And I suggest you do that. And here's a nice little uh, PowerPoint. You know how I feel about PowerPoint. You can read. So I'm not going to sit here and bore you by flipping through those things. Look at this, though. This is a web page. Does a nice job. It does a nice job of explaining theoretical and, and uh, conceptual frameworks to you. Okay. Again, I'm going to let you do this reading. So why are we looking at it? Let's bring it home. We are looking at it because we need to understand because one of the biggest problems we have with technology used in education is lack of data. Oh, we have tons of data when it comes to um, we went out and bought so many computers. We have one-to-one um, -one projects going on right now in Jefferson County where kids are being given iPads. And there is, you can't see it, but I'm doing air quotes right now. There is research being done. And so what is it basically saying? Does this iPad increase student performance at the middle school level? Anybody out there who's taken any kind of research class, you ought to be screaming right now. What the heck did that just mean? Where is the underpinnings there? What are we looking for? Are we looking at this through the lens of TPEC? Are we looking at it through the lens of Tim? Are we looking at it through the lens of, lens of Sammer? What are you looking at it through? Well, we're, 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 going, to we're going to look at their um, MPAs and LPAs. Those are the tests they take throughout the semester, throughout the school year, uh, to see how their performance increases with the use of the technology. Well, what does the use of technology mean? This is why when we started doing our research with the TPAC, one of the first things that we stumbled onto was there was tons, there are tons of dissertations out there that have to do with technology use in education. And, you know, don't think K-12, you know, think all the way through, all the way through to college and actually research uh, institutions. And the thing that we kept coming back to over and over again, and this is why uh, Kohler and, and Punya came up with what they came up with, was there was no framework out there where you could really hang something. Most of the time it looked like something like, quantitatively, it looked something like, so um, let's try using this 
and let's see if you learn better. Hello. What was that? Hmm. Hey, uh, was that that stimulus response thing that he just flashed up on the screen and took away? Now I can't see it. Let's see here. Oh, there it is. Okay. But what, how did you do that? What instrument did you use? Well, we gave them a test, and then we gave them another test. We gave them a test, we applied the stimulus, and we gave them another test. And then the qualitative people go, no, 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 no. What we wanted to know was, did we affect their understandings, and did we affect their beliefs in how what they're using is, is changing their thinking and their learning. Okay. All right. We do that. You and I do that, especially those of you who have been with me and if you need an extra three hours and you've had the 587 class, I've always said to you, you can get six more hours of independent study by applying the structure and the things that you learned in the 587 class to your own classroom using either the Google Classroom or the Schoology Classroom. We haven't, no one's thrown down the gauntlet and said we all will use one or the other. Uh, and then looking at it through the QM lens, the Quality Matters lens. Then after you've done that one, we turn right around and we actually put it in play out there in your classroom and we actually do some you know, straightforward, let's look at it through a research lens. Are we making a difference using this uh, structure that you created in online with increasing kids' understandings of fill in the blank? That is why we have to take the time to understand these structures. Simple as that. Let's take just a second here to talk about ISTE, and then we'll talk about the assignment, and then we'll wrap up. ISTE standards. Yay! ISTE standards. Here's a cute little video. Been around. Here's a PowerPoint, which I'm not going to do because you'll kill me. That's the thing about ISTE stuff. It tries to be cute. But, oh, my gosh. Oh, here. Let's just throw it up here real fast. And I know, I know, those of you who are sitting out there right now are saying, we can't see it when you do it this way, Steve. Trust me. It's slide after numbing slide. But let's drop down here and take a look at the standards. Here they are. These are the ISTE standards. Now, these are important. Okay, I'll quit being making fun of things, and we'll get serious about these. So ISTE standard number one for students, and this is a direct connect, okay, dot A to dot B, back to understanding by design, facets of understanding. Okay, when we get into all of that, your brain should then kick over to here and go, oh, so that would be that ISTE standard number one. Creativity and innovation. Students demonstrate creative thinking, construct knowledge, and develop innovative products and process using technology. Hello. Understanding by design. Communication and collaboration. Students, students use digital media and environments to communicate and work collaboratively, including at a distance, support individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Collaboration and communication can be asking a kid to create a Google slide deck, PowerPoint, <laughs> uh, that demonstrates their understanding whatever you've been teaching in class. It can be kids using a tool like an infographic tool to, again, do a demonstration making meaning of what they've been taught and then transferring it by placing it somewhere for everybody else can see. I had to go over to go to number three and four. Research and information fluencies. Teacher, excuse me, students apply digital tools to gather, evaluate, and use information. 
This is a simple one. Repeat after me. Wikipedia is not a primary source. Wikipedia is not a primary source. In a lot of ways, it's not even a secondary source. But that's what we're trying to do here, is we're trying to get kids to understand Twitter is not a primary source. Unless, unless, it's like someone like Jenny Bay Williams, who's talking about her textbook that she wrote. Yep, that's a primary source. But if it's Joe Bob Silly Sue, who's out there teaching somewhere, and he's saying, you ought to be using... Dr. Bay Williams' textbook on mathematics, it's the best thing you've ever seen. That ain't primary source. Well, you know that. We need to teach kids that because they don't understand it. Heck, when I'm teaching the 201 kids here at our college, they don't understand it. Critical thinking, problem solving, decision making. If we can teach kids anything, this is why I'm a big believer in EIE, by the way. If we can teach kids anything, and I don't know, you know, it'd probably be a cool thing to do is to take that engineering mind model and see how we could bring it into this world that you and I kind of live in here. You know, kids understanding, I have a theory. This is how I test my theory. Here are my results. What do I do with when I have failure? What do I do when I have success? You know, it's such a simple idea. And we don't teach it hard enough. We do not honor that process of working through the problem solving. We just give these goofy examples and say to kids, okay, now get together in your groups and let's problem solve. <laughs> And usually the problem solve is, can I get the same answer as the teacher sitting up there with? I get an A. I'm a big, big believer in number four, as well as number one. Digital citizenship. This used to be, <laughs> this used to be the ISTE standards. I've been around enough, long enough. And then they kind of woke up one day and said, um, yeah, okay, well, everybody kind of has a phone and everybody kind of knows what to do with phones. And all of that has become part of our society and culture now. And so for us to be running around talking about um, things like netiquette and phishing and um, the proper use of email and don't type in all caps, all that stuff, you know, everybody's kind of nodding their heads and going, yeah, okay, okay. Well, they still had to keep it around because they kind of they kind of created digital citizenship. Okay. Students understand human, cultural, and societal issues related to technology and practice legal and ethical behavior. That is, when you make your Google Slides deck, you don't go out and steal somebody's pictures. Or you give, you know, you give credit. Again. This is a hard one. This is a hard one anymore because how hard is it to get something off of the interwebs? Can you say right click, save image as, highlight, copy, paste into Word? So this still has you know significant meaning. I was I teach a class in the summer, 580. Um, and it's called digital citizenship. <laughs> and one of the things that I did this summer is I totally rewrote it from top to bottom. And I rewrote it to get away from what I call the thou shall not attitude of the original digital citizenship. Thou shall not uh, go into Facebook and hook up with someone you think is 14 years old when it turns out to be a 45 year old man. Thou shalt not, you know, all those things. Now, I'm not downplaying those. Those are significant issues that we need to deal with. But there's a better way. And I found it in a book written by a young lady who is a librarian, uh, Wisconsin, I think. Just got her PhD from University of. And it's a darn good book. And we went and used that book. And yes, it does have the thou shalt not. But what it really has is 
How do we show kids the proper way? And how do we show kids the hello demonstration of understanding, transfer of meaning? How do we show that within the framework of digital citizenship? This is a great class. I really enjoyed teaching it. And I rediscovered a lot of stuff that I had that I did oh 10, 15 years ago when it was still the very first beginnings, well, not the first beginnings, but sort of the, the beginnings, we figured out how to use the web. In other words, we didn't have to understand FTPs anymore and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we started with things like Global Schoolhouse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, email was new. So, and we were discovering how we could use that to teach with. Yeah. And I we walked away from that because, heck, you got an email account? Sure, send me an email. Heck, you got a text number? I'll text you. You know, you got an Instagram account? You know, but now it's it's come back full circle. Now, now we're looking at communities um, where people are working together on um, collaborations of doing classroom research together. There's some really cool stuff out there. And if you want to talk to me about that being rolled into a independent study, hey, I'm ready. Number six is technology operations and concepts. Notice how they left that one for the last. That's a TPAC moment right there. Okay. Yes, we know how to need to know how to use the thing. What we really need to know how to do is to problem solve using the thing. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I first laid my hands on and started looking at Google Classroom, I did not go into full-blown step one, step two, step three, step four, step five mode like I did a million years ago when I first started learning Microsoft Office, excuse me, when I first started learning Apple Works slash Claris Works and then graduated to Microsoft Office where all the adults were. Um, I didn't do that with Office, with uh, Google. Why? Because I had enough background knowledge I could look at a Google Doc and go, oh, well, you do that over there, you do that over there, that's just like Word, and that's just like Word, and that's just like Word. Of course, what's different is then you need to understand the Google Doc because it has, as its claim to fame, the incredible simplicity of how you can do collaboration with a Google Doc over, say, a Word. When we were getting together this summer, you could tell, you could tell the old-time technology teachers that were in the group because when we talked about well we'll do all of this distance uh, communication about the standards and the writing and all of that people are going well we, we could do a one note we could do a word document with commenting and then the people who had sort of moved on were basically going are you out of your ever loving mind have you looked at a Google Doc? Well, we don't do that. We teach Word, and we teach PowerPoint, and we teach Excel, and we teach Access. And you just kind of sit there and you go, wow. Oh, we even had a big, big fight over should there be standards for keyboarding. I'll talk about that in a second. So this is ISTE standards. This is what's running behind what we're doing when we're looking at things that have to do with technology in our classroom, or we should be. Now, I'm going to leave this one to you for you to watch. Uh, it's really well done. And when he wanders, or not wanders off, when he pivots over to designing for, I think it's a nursing, I think he's doing it for nursing, a nursing uh, curriculum, you can go ahead and stop it there. But it's really, really well done. Now, as I said, I'm not wanting you to do anything with curriculum design because we can't, because you have a curriculum. But I just kind of want you to get a sense of what it is. I, as I said, I love doing curriculum design. It's just one of those things that maybe someday you'll be sitting on a panel that's doing curriculum design. Um, I've, I've had people walking in here uh, in my office here this week who are uh, freshly minted, 
freshly minted uh, doctorates, and they're saying that they're looking at all these different jobs that people are looking for, instructional uh, design people, uh, technology design people. And so we've, we've sat and had long conversations about what that looks like, because most of the time, what that looks like in industry is, especially when it comes like to training stuff, is they basically just want you to take whatever it was that they created that was paper-based and turn that into something electronic. Don't go crazy. <laughs> Don't do anything. A little off, though, you know. Keep it this. Um, and if you were to say the word captivate to anybody, they kind of get a little nervous and look around. <laughs> now let's do the uh, assignment. So we're looking at a different kind of tool to use. Uh, to do infographics. I like this tool because I find that it can do more than our old friend, the picture chart. And I find that it has um, better, better templates. That's really why I went with it. So if you click on the link that says build your own infographic, by the way, watch the videos. It's pretty straightforward. You'll have to create an account. That account will be free. Um, if you want to have access to the um, premium templates, you have to pay for it. I'm going to tell you right now, don't, don't waste your money. Uh, the templates that are in here that are the free templates are excellent. Um, I'm going to log in with my little account that I made. Um, you're not using my account anymore because, like I said, you can have your own. And I want you to, um, you know, ex explore. And here's what I mean. So um, let me jump back out and back out. And let's look at what uh, TV wants us to do for this one. So in module one, he's asking you to go in, create an infographic using VisMe to compare the ideas, conceptual and theoretical frameworks. What concepts do they share? What con concepts differentiate, if differentiate them? Use material provided by your readings. Underline, underline, underline. Use material provided by your readings, please. Feel free to copy and paste, please. Just notate where it came from, please. So when I'm in VisMe, VisMe, I guess, VisualMe, I don't know. If I come up here and type in comparisons, Oh, it's telling me it can't find any. Well, that's not right, because it does find them. Um, yeah, huh, huh, huh. Let me go over here, and let's just go ahead and start a new project. Let's just do that. And that way you'll see what I'm doing. So I'm going to go ahead and go in here, and um, you can make five of these, by the way, on a free account. Otherwise, you're, you know using all kinds of things. And so as you can see, it takes you through. It has some nice where it holds your hands and walks you through how to do it and all that good stuff. Here's where your stuff lives that you can use. Um, over here is where you're basically where all the big stuff is. Okay. Um, it's, it's simple. OK. And you're going to do an infographic. You're not doing a presentation. Let me go back to my dashboard. OK. I'm going to create an infographic. Now let's do that. There's where I should have done this uh, keyword search. Comparisons. Oh. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I could do something. Let's let's just grab that one. Edit. This is very very similar to pick the chart at this point, if you remember. And then when it comes up, now you, you're gonna have to put up with this, right? Yeah. 
because it keeps coming in and saying, hey, let me show you this. Just go down here and say, okay, got it. And it'll leave you alone. Or go over and watch it if you need to. Now, so what we can do here is, again, we can go in and you can change what it says in the boxes by just double clicking into it. And now you can work theoretical and okay if you want to go in here and change this up if you want to use a different um, graphic you can go in there you can go in and you could go through here and wipe these out and put in what you want if you got stuff down here that you don't need well all righty you just basically going to click on it excuse me you're going to click on it and you're going to get rid of it that easy okay and then like i said over here let's go ahead and get rid of some stuff here so let's get rid of that let's get rid of that get rid of that you got to dig down and get rid of all the different little pieces they put on things and then if i want to go over here and i'm looking at my graphics um and if i want to find technology got quite a few um, I could bring something in as simple as that and you know I can use that as a header that then has some information underneath it I'm not going to go too far because you know I want you to play and there's folders with photos in it and just like uh, with our other friend, you can upload things right here. So if you've got a good picture out there that you want to use, you can upload that and put it in. There's no longer a um, sample pictures in Windows 10. Sorry about that. Okay. You get the idea. Media. You can insert a video from you know where. You can change your theme colors. Here's where your files would be that you have uploaded. Data, you don't have to mess with data. Okay. You could use this, though, as a way of you can link it over to an Excel spreadsheet so that when you change the data in the Excel spreadsheet, it changes the way it looks over here. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. All right, remember to give it a title up here. Don't forget to do that. Um, and then how do I get it from here after I've done it? I go to share. And you don't need to do the embed. Just come up here and do publish for web. You can give it a little, you know, here's... Here's what it's all about. And there it is. So there's your link. You will then copy that link. And over here in the assignments place. Where Steve will fix those point values. When you go in here and you say write submission, you're going to go in here and you're going to paste that in. And then you're going to submit it. That's it. Now, here's one of the things that I dearly, dearly love about Blackboard over live text. When I do that sort of thing, it comes in as a link. So it's nice and clean that way. All right, let's wrap up. So what we did tonight is we went back and we went over the structure of our course. We realized Steve needs to fix some things. Well, not some things. He needs to fix the values of the assignments. They're correct in the uh, syllabus. We went over and we talked about 
how all of this hangs together off of a central theme, and here is the central theme. That will be module three. When I see you again, we will be looking at TPAC and Tim. We will be doing a deep dive into both of those because we need to understand why they are important to this process. And not just to this process for this little class, but this should be, or something similar to it, should be behind every study that is attempted or just a, so how are we doing with the technology? How are we doing out there with giving every kid an iPad? How are we doing with giving every kid a Chromebook? How are we doing with using Google Classroom? Every single one of those should have a solid background of data collection going on and what it means. Okay, that's it for tonight. Um, not bad. I went for about an hour and a half. We will be back here next Tuesday night. Again, the whole point of this is you don't have to be here if you don't want to be here. Uh, let's see if Mark's still in the room here with me. Mark is still in the room with me. One last thing I want to show you. Mark, may I use you as an example? Okay, will do. All right, Mark is in the Collaborate Ultra right now, and he's been sitting there nodding off, trying to keep himself away because I've been droning on. And when we do the final, the way the final will work is I'll put out a doodle calendar. Probably mid-October, that doodle calendar will be your place to go in and say, all right, Steve, I'm going to come in and visit you virtually um, in, I don't know, November, first week in November or the last week in October, whenever we get done. And I'm going to show you what I've created. And you're going to talk to me about it. Now, the way that will work is you will come in and it'll be just you and me. It won't be like Mark and uh, four other people, okay? It'll just be you and me. Uh, and we'll come in and I will come over here to your name as it shows up in my little um, groupy thing here in my chat window. And I will click on that and I will make you the moderator. And once I make you the moderator, you will have to go down and do the trick that I do and I'll make sure you understand that, where you go down here and see mine is, uh, I, yeah, I have to close it off, and then you won't see what I'm doing. But there's a little uh, chevron right here that you click, and one of the things it says there, share. And you will share your screen with me, and then you will show me the things that you have edited in your five lessons and all of that. And you'll talk to me about it. That'll be your final. Now, you'll take all that, and you'll put it into the assignments here, in our blackboard and of course then we'll upload that into the live text but you're going to literally sit and, and talk with me have a virtual collab uh tell you why i'm doing this is first of all it's easier on you um but also because those who have been doing independent studies where they're out in schools and they have google classrooms that are school focused or they're school in the school domain we can't get into those domains here at the university of Louisville. Believe me, I've been trying. We could, if the University of Louisville would create a Google domain, which again, I've tried to do, and ran into the biggest stone wall you've ever seen. Um, and I've worked with the folks in Jefferson County Public Schools and at the state with saying, well, could I have, could you allow me to have an account like you do parents who are allowed to come in and look at a, the the Google Classroom of their student, and the only thing they see is what their students have done. They don't see anybody else's. And we're still talking, at least, on that one. 
So my point is, is if you do an independent study where you go and you take that 587 class you created and actually put it into a Google Classroom or the ideas behind it, and then put it in and we actually do research on it, we would then, I would come in by doing uh, collaborate and then you would show me your Google Classroom. You can do that. I did that this summer with um, you know, a bunch of folks and it works really, really well. Okay, that's it for the evening. I'm done. Uh, this video should be available by um, later tonight, actually, if, if it's working, if they'll flip the time on creating it. And as I said, of course, I'll have the assignment numbers fixed. As always, if you have any concerns, any questions, if you catch something that's wrong, please text me at 502-457-2937. Uh, if you need to hear my, my voice and you get sick of hearing it this way and you just want to talk to me on a phone, that's my phone number as well, and I'll be glad to talk to you. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Appreciate you, man. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying that new uh, planetarium room you got over there in Strickler. I tell you, I was in it this summer. Uh, we did one of our retreats over there in the room, and I was talking to Treader about all the cool um, stuff you've got in there. I, I'm still not giving up the dream. <laughs> and, the, and I told Drew about this dream, and I've told... Um, Tom about the dream as well. So I'll tell you and, and Bree, the dream is hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment is sitting in closets in JCPS um, that used to be the makerspace stuff that they had uh, that we used to go out and that the teachers could go and visit and they could show them different things, very tea packy, very much tea pack stuff the teacher could go and put their hands on and play with, you know, everything from VRs, the Spiro balls to the little, um, what do they call them? The little balls that you program and then they follow, you know, a thing around, uh, the one where you can literally draw a line, you know, all that cool stuff. And then of course the, the beginning programming stuff, all that stuff is sitting in a closet and I'm trying to see what do I have to pull, what, in other words, what lever do I have to pull in JCPS to get that stuff brought over, because you got the space for it now, you know, um, back there where all of your globes and spheres and planet and all that stuff is sitting back there, we could put it all back there, and you guys, you guys could have it, and we could then say to JCPS, hey, we here at the University of Louisville, we'll be more than happy uh, to let you bring your students in here, and our STEM teachers will be more than happy to talk to you about how to really teach STEM. Or we could be having classes about teaching STEM, and we could utilize that space. Anyway, that's a dream, but I'm still working that dream, man. Thank you, Mark, for being here, and the rest of you, thank you. I'll see you next Tuesday night. Good for you. Maybe we'll all come together someday. <laughs> Talk to you, man.